Rome has no shortage of monuments commemorating military victories. Even the Colosseum, funded from spoils of war looted from Jerusalem, shouted Roman success and supremacy with the scale of the structure and the spectacles it hosted. From its earliest days, Rome was militaristic to the core, driven to expansion by existential threats posed by its neighbours, first in Italy and then abroad. Few structures pay stronger testament to Rome's bellicose nature than its triumphal arches, and that so many triumphal arches have been reinterpreted and replicated across the ages, from the Arc de Triomphe in Paris to the Soldiers' and Sailors' Arch in New York City, speaks volumes about how this form of cultural expression was not unique to Rome, but repeats across humanity. The reason we call these arches triumphal is because the SPQR, or the Senate and People of Rome, awarded them to victorious generals returning to Rome to celebrate their triumph. Part religious, part propagandistic, the Roman triumph was essentially a victory parade, in which victorious generals would adorn the costume of a god and parade through the city to the adulation of the crowds. Spoils of war would be paraded, coins would be thrown to those who had gathered, and the triumphant general, born in a chariot with a slave behind him, whispering a reminder in his ear that he was only a mortal, would make his way up the Capitoline Hill to make dedications at the temple of Jupiter Optimus Maximus. The earliest arches we know about, none of which survive, were erected on the Capitoline Hill and in the Roman Forum. They functioned as a kind of monumental message board, displaying the militaristic achievements of prestigious Romans past and present, and becoming more and more competitive as time went on. Let's take a closer look at three of Rome's most famous triumphal arches. The Arch of Constantine. Standing just outside the Colosseum, on the ancient route into the Roman Forum, the Arch of Constantine is the largest and most conspicuous surviving arch in the city of Rome. Sharing a similar design to the Arch of Septimius Severus, it stood on the Via Sacra, the Sacred Way, the processional route victorious generals took during their parade through the city. Passing from the Circus Maximus and under the Arch of Constantine, they would then process into the Roman Forum and up the Capitoline Hill to make offerings at the Temple of Jupiter. After this, they would disperse for the day's banquets, games and other celebratory events, all of which were funded by the general himself. The Senate dedicated the arch in 315 AD to commemorate Constantine's victory over his rival Maxentius at the Battle of Milvian Bridge three years earlier. No scenes from the Battle of the Milvian Bridge appear on the arch, but if you visit the Vatican's Raphael rooms, you can see a much later fresco, executed by Raphael's students, depicting this significant moment in Roman history. And its significance can't be overstated, for had Constantine not defeated Maxentius at the battle, then Christianity may never have taken root to become the dominant religion in the Roman Empire, and, consequently, of today's world. Although we call it the Arch of Constantine, the arch could more accurately be described as an imperial collage, recycling material from monuments of several previous emperors, including Trajan, Hadrian, who built the Pantheon, and Marcus Aurelius, the philosopher emperor whose equine statue stands in the centre of the Capitoline Museums. Stripped of the colour and statues that once adorned it, the Arch of Constantine is a shell of its former self. Once supported by yellow Corinthian columns of Numidian marble and red, green and purple porphyry decorating the friezes and statues atop it, in its heyday the Arch of Constantine would have been eye-catching, much like the Colosseum itself. During the Middle Ages, the Arch of Constantine, like many other Roman monuments including the Colosseum, was incorporated into fortifications of one of Rome's foremost aristocratic families. The family in question was the Frangipani family, who, in the 12th century, also fortified the Colosseum, and from whom, according to Boccaccio, Dante was descended. By the 15th century, however, they had ceded control of the arch, as they lost their power and influence in the city of Rome. It was only in the early 2000s that the Arch of Constantine was subjected to the restoration work it much needed. The Arch of Titus Standing at the entrance of the Roman Forum, the Arch of Titus was actually erected after the Emperor's untimely death in 81 AD. It was probably dedicated by Titus's brother and successor Domitian, 
whose legacy in Rome includes the circus beneath Piazza Navona and the Imperial Palace on the Palatine Hill. We know that Titus had died by the time the arch was dedicated because of the inscription on its front. The giveaway is its reference to the divine and therefore deceased Titus, as emperors could only be declared gods after shuffling off their mortal coil. The reliefs inside the arch of Titus tell the story of the construction of the Colosseum. Titus was the emperor who finally captured Jerusalem in 70 AD, after a protracted war between Rome and Judea, led by his father, Vespasian. After storming the city, the Romans sacked it, looting the treasures of its temple and taking them back with them to Rome. Such then is the potency of the Arch of Titus's narrative and symbolism that up until the establishment of the modern state of Israel, Jews had always refused to walk through it. During the Middle Ages, the arch was fortified, again by the Frangipani family, and incorporated into their stronghold. It suffered terrible damage in the process, however, and had to be almost completely restored early in the 19th century. The arch of Septimius Severus. Rising up between the Coria, the Senate House, and the Rostra at the foot of the Capitoline Hill, the triumphal arch of Septimius Severus dominates the Roman Forum. It was dedicated in 203 AD to monumentalise the military victory of Rome's first sovereign emperor. As was customary on Roman triumphal arches, it contained a dedicatory inscription listing the emperor's many titles Augustus, Pater Patriae, Pontifex Maximus, Proconsul, and explaining why the Senate and people of Rome saw fit to dedicate an arch in his honour, in this case for beating the Parthians, saving the Republic, and expanding the Empire. Crediting Septimius Severus with actually saving the Republic is a little disingenuous. In reality, the Emperor did little more than survive the political fallout that followed the death of Commodus, and outlast his rivals, Pescinius Niger and Clodius Albinus, in their own bids for the Imperial throne by fighting a civil war. But credit where credit's due. He did expand the Empire, pacifying the Parthians and incorporating much of Syria into Roman territory. The Arch of Septimius Severus displays a pretty comprehensive visual program, as well as two depictions of Mars, the god of war, a representation of Hercules, several natural divinities including the four seasons and the river gods, it contains the more profane illustrations of Rome's legionaries leading away Parthian prisoners. Face the arch from inside the Roman Forum and you'll see that the illustrations provide a comprehensive narrative of Severus's campaigns. To get the chronology, you have to go from left to right and bottom to top. Firstly, you see the Roman army departing from their camp, their battle with the Parthians, the Emperor Septimius Severus himself delivering a rousing victory speech, and then comes the liberation of Nisbis, the siege and capture of the city of Edessa, and Severus's reception among his populace as a god. We then see another submission, this time of King Akbar and the Osroeni in modern-day Turkey, which leads to Severus delivering another victory speech to the army. The campaign continues. He attacks Seleucia and drives the Parthians to flight, bringing about Seleucia's surrender and Parthia's submission to Roman rule. Finally, Severus' army attacks Ctesiphon, a city just south of modern-day Baghdad, with a siege tower, and after its capitulation the emperor gives a final speech to his victorious army just outside. With such a rich visual programme, the arch of Septimius Severus certainly shows a lot, but it's what it doesn't show that's most interesting. And what it doesn't show is the emperor's son, Geta. Left to share the throne with Severus's other son, Caracalla, Geta was murdered by his brother in 211, dying in the arms of his devastated mother. Caracalla then carried out the Damniato Memoriae of his brother, expunging all visual and epigraphic traces of his existence, including on this arch. The fact that we know about this shows at least that his efforts were in vain. If you've enjoyed this video and want to check out some similar content and virtual tours, then hit like and subscribe to our channel. There you will also find the link to our website where you can find our full catalogue of tours.